Hello and welcome to the Best Practices Summit. Pollinator Friendly Alliance is a grassroots 501c3 nonprofit that protects the natural world through the conservation of pollinators. Our co-host is the Xerxes Society, a science-based nonprofit. Eric Lee Motter, I am one of the uh, pollinator and ag biodiversity program directors at the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. You guys know who Xerces is, so I'm not going to do the whole spiel. I will just say that when I started over a decade ago, almost two decades ago coming up here, um, we were like the army of the 12 monkeys working out of a dark bunker like graffiti covered building in Portland uh, with homeless encampments outside our office and it's kind of amazing uh, to not only see our growth as an organization, but to see all of you people out there who are equally interested and engaged in the conservation of insects and invertebrates. So good on all of you. It's great to be on this journey with all of you. My work at Xerces, I will just point out, is mostly focused on agricultural uh, regions. I oversee most of the private sector work that we do with uh, food companies, primarily in the organic and natural food space. And I've got a brilliant team of people who are much smarter and more capable than me out there working to scale up habitat like this on farms across, uh, I was going to say the United States, but increasingly across North America. We've got a ton of work in South America, and uh, we just seem to be accelerating this globally, which is uh, deeply rewarding to me. I will just also point out because it's more relevant to this talk and this conversation today, which is about meadows and primarily about meadows outside of the Midwest, where I know this audience has historically had the biggest representation. I also am uh, the, the uh, minor principal co-owner of Northwest Meadowscapes Native Seed. I'm actually in our seed shop here today in Port Townsend, Washington. We have a farm over on Whidbey Island, and you may be graced by the sound of the ferry horn as the boat travels back and forth during my talk. Um, but the much of what I'm going to talk about here in the next uh, little bit is really informed by this work, uh, this meadow work that we do and the native uh, plant work that we do, as well as my work with Xerces. So uh, I'm going to begin with the some pretty simplistic concepts. I try to always leave the most riveting and interesting and radical stuff towards the end. Uh, but this is essentially a talk about meadows and uh, meadow making and sort of the greatness of meadows and the uniqueness of meadow ecosystems, again, particularly outside of the Midwest. And I use the term meadows when I know all of my Midwestern colleagues use the term prairie, but we're talking about roughly the same thing. Um, Teddy Roosevelt in one of his early memoirs has this passage where he said, we have taken into our language the word prairie because when our backwoodsmen first reached the land and saw the great natural meadows of long grass, sites unknown, <clears throat> to the gloomy forests wherein they had always dwelt. They knew not what to call them and borrowed the term already in use among the French inhabitants, prairies. Um, so prairie uh, is, is essentially sort of the French uh, word for meadow and comes from the Latin uh, pratum for meadow, which is a, a term that has roots in a number of our uh, species names. Uh, if, if many of you are probably familiar with red clover, trifolium uh, pretense, meaning the meadow dwelling clover. 
But there are these linguistic artifacts that are threaded throughout our language. There's actually a lot of really interesting agroecology uh, agro language that's embedded in our everyday, uh, everyday conversations. Um, but you could also consider weed uh, or weeds, which is derived from the, the Dutch and Old German words for meadows as well. And uh, these are, of course, uh, plant communities that are dominated by grasses and forbs or grasses and wildflowers. In the part of the world where I live in northwestern Washington here uh, on the seacoast, on the tip of the sort of dividing my time between the tip of the Olympic Peninsula and an island in the middle of the Salish Sea, uh, I think about and, and I think commonly ecologists in this part of the world think about meadows as being either natural features or anthropogenic features. If we just focus on the natural uh, meadows here for a moment, and you can see I use that in quotes, um, we have sort of our transitional meadows, which is the classic story of early plant succession, where say you have a forest fire that removes the trees and the shrubs, and that landscape is then replaced by grasses and wildflowers. And then slowly over time, the shrub layer builds back up and the tree seedlings move back in. And that, that story of plant succession uh, repeats itself. So those are transitional or temporary meadows, we might say. We also have permanent meadows. And this is, uh, you know, this rule of thumb, I think, has fairly broad global applicability. But when we think about permanent meadows, we're usually thinking about locations that are not favorable for trees. So the, the great prairies of the inland uh, Midwest and Northern Plains, the interior grasslands of other continents. These are landscapes that are prone to periodic wildfires. They're prone to routine droughts. We could also think about alpine meadows or tundras where it's too cold and too harsh and there may not be a lot of uh, soil for trees to actually establish in. Uh, here where I live, we have coastal meadows. These are uh, lands, particularly bluff tops near the ocean with heavy, heavy regular winds and salt spray, and they're not favorable for tree growth. And then we also have wet meadows, areas where maybe other than a few shrubby willows, um, they're just too wet or too seasonally wet and have uh, really fluctuating hydrology that makes it difficult for trees to establish and thrive. Now, Probably everyone attending today recognizes the simple truth that bees and butterflies are primarily animals or creatures of open sunny habitats. Grasslands and meadows, prairies all typically have higher uh, abundance, uh, abundances of, of these animals, higher pollinator abundance than forests do. Um, and of course there are exceptions to that, but you'll even see uh, some interesting references among the scientists today doing bee surveys. I saw an interesting thread and some of the bee monitoring listservs last year commenting on how when people were surveying bees in forests, they'd always find the, the greatest numbers of them in the sun spots in the little areas of the forest where the sunlight filters down and you get a warm little pool of sunlight. So meadows, of course, provide that in abundance. Uh, we also know that meadows have the ability to sequester carbon. They have the ability to unfortunately leak carbon dioxide into the atmosphere as well, depending upon management and disturbance. We know that these are plant communities that are exceptional for biofiltering and water infiltration. This is why even in Midwestern farm settings, we plant grassed waterways or 
uh, prairie strips or vegetative buffers of prairie plants adjacent to, to riparian areas. Um, we tend to pay less attention to the economic value of meadows, but of course, these are historically where we graze livestock. These are the landscapes that we harvest for livestock fodder. Uh, we have uh, talked as a society about the potential of these landscapes for biofuels. And there's a huge tradition of food crops arising, evolving in meadows. And most of what we eat, the wheat, the corn, uh, that make up the, the preponderance of the Western diet. These are meadow plants. Um, I won't spend much time here talking about the, the economics of establishing and maintaining meadows. And I don't necessarily think that the, the graph here on screen is reflective of accurate costs in all parts of the country. But the general rule of thumb and the general story that we've told ourselves as vegetation or restoration practitioners is that, yeah, you may pay more um, or you may pay substantially to establish a prairie or a meadow landscape. Uh, but over time, the management of that and the inputs associated with that in the form of irrigation water or fertilizer or herbicides is lower in that meadow or that prairie plant community compared to a conventional lawn. And I think roughly that that pans out, you know, this is this is probably a more accurate <laughs> and intuitive representation of the, the economics and the inputs and labor costs of turf or lawns compared to meadows. You can see at the top there, you know, a, the maintenance of a lawn is the constant mowing that goes into it, the fertilizer that goes into it, the water that goes into it. And meadows and prairies are much more functional on this um, short duration, um, typically annual maintenance of mowing or burning that we do and, and some selective weeding. So with all of that groundwork out of the way, I wanted to introduce folks to a, a unique meadow ecosystem that exists here in the Northwest. And to tell the story of that, both from a human perspective and what this means historically for the people of this region and to tell a contemporary story of what this means for the region, as well as maybe share some of the research and development that's going on here that might inspire you guys working in totally different areas to think about and, and maybe it will um, spark your imagination to, to try to apply some of these concepts where you are. So uh, of course here in the Pacific Northwest, the iconic vegetation imagery that people have in mind is that of like the dark rainforests, the big dug fir forests with ferns and uh, this lush moss layer that grows underneath them. And that is true, but it's true in locations. And in fact, we have kind of a central trough that exists in Oregon and Washington and British Columbia and Northern California, where you have a, you've got the coast, you've got a coastal mountain range, and then you've got the Cascade mountain range. And between them, you've got this lowland area. And this lowland area gets a little bit less water because the rain coming in off the coast drops, the, drops much of its precipitation into the coastal mountain range. And so the valley or the trough, which is made up by Puget Sound, the Salish Sea, the Willamette Valley in Oregon, it gets a little bit less rainfall. And this was a, uh, a lowland area where they, at one point in time, one of the dominant tree species was the Gary Oak. And it's a little bit drier of uh, a, a drier adapted plant species. And within that, you had this prairie savanna, prairie oak savanna ecosystem that existed. 
And as of today, probably less than 1% of that ecosystem remains. Now, the Gary Oak savanna was only one type of the, the natural or permanent meadows that existed here. We also had these coastal balds, um, which I mentioned, um, these areas where the salt spray and the wind make it impossible or difficult for trees to establish. We've got other areas of glacial outwash with very thin gravel soils, and we've got these Mima mound uh, complexes, which are one of the more unique landscape features in North America, every bit as mysterious as Stonehenge. And uh, as far as I know, it's still, still to be explained by any solid geomorphological theory. We also have wet meadows and vernal pools, but to be truthful, the majority of these meadow landscapes in our region are anthropogenic meadows, or historically they were. These were areas that were routinely burned by native people for essentially agricultural production, uh, especially the, the, to enhance open sunny habitat for camas, the, the dominant meadow wildflower in uh, many of these anthropogenic uh, meadows, which has an edible bulb, but there were all these other plants with edible bulbs that in, uh, you know, I guess less politically correct times used to be referred to as Indian potatoes. Um, but to be clear, um, these are some of now some of the rarer plants in our species. These are some of the more ecologically important plants. From a cultural standpoint, these are plants that are in desperate need of preservation. They also have some of the more most kind of beautifully poetic native names like Quamash and Yampa and Uko. Uh, and these were entirely dependent on this combination of fire and digging to sustain these plants. And one of the amazing things about bulbs, of course, is that if you break them, you end up with two pieces, and each of those can re-sprout and regrow. Um, and the camas, you know, the, the native elders here say, and I, I think this is um, some of the most important wisdom that we have for the maintenance of these meadows, is that the more you dig these meadows, the better the camas does. Um, Camas or quamash, as it was uh, sometimes called, um, was documented very early on by white explorers. Lewis and Clark talked about this. Meriwether Lewis wrote about how um, traveling into the Northwest, um, coming over the Rocky Mountains and then coming into the Northwest, how they would see these vast blue lakes off in the distance and they would travel over to them and this is what they found that they were not uh, lakes in the sense of surface water but they were lowland areas with uh, high water tables where people were digging these camas plants and harvesting massive quantities of them and along with salmon this was the one of the principal food sources for people here in this part of the world. Now, some of the unique features of our plant communities in this corner of the universe are a direct result of our, our unique maritime climate. So unlike, say, Minnesota or Wisconsin, where the, the dormant season is fall and winter when the snow is coming down, our dormant season here is in midsummer when there's no rain, when all of the wildflowers have stopped blooming when things turn brown and dry and they start to dry down and set their seed. We have cool winters, but oftentimes winters without freezing, at least at low elevations. It's often cloudy here for days and days and days at a time. And so we end up with plant communities that are dominated by cool season species. We don't have things like switchgrass or big blue stem. Instead, we've got grasses like tufted hair grass, um, deschampsia or fescues, grasses that you would find in uh, Eastern Siberia or in the UK. Uh, we've got 
wildflowers like prunella, self heal, which grows in um, sort of a circumpolar distribution, again, in, in Western European meadows, uh, sea thrift, which you might otherwise find on, on coastal cliffs in Newfoundland or Iceland or Scotland. We've got native clovers. We've got this incredible plant that I will talk more about called the yellow rattle, Rhinanthus minor. Um, and because of the lack of freezing temperatures, at least deeply freezing temperatures, and the abundance of rainfall, basically every weed in the world grows here and grows prolifically. So that's some of the background and some of the, the challenges we face with. Uh, because these plants have both ecological um, dimensions and ecological value, as well as really deep cultural traditions, there is a growing movement in the Pacific Northwest to reintegrate meadows into human landscapes. And as I said, less than 1% of the, the historic meadows still remain. And I think people are now recognizing that um, we're, we're missing part of what used to be here. And in fact, we all know we're missing part, uh, big parts of what used to be everywhere. Um, this, this particular photo, which always uh, gives me sort of a grim chuckle is a, a monarch mural, obviously on the middle, on the top of this apartment building in the middle of the Tenderloin district in San Francisco where, uh, you would be hard pressed to find a monarch or to find wildflowers. But we know that less than, uh, you know, three to 5% of the American landscape is, is undisturbed habitat for wildlife. So responding to this, here in the Northwest, we have conservation agencies, which have come out in recent years, um, like the Multnomah Conservation District in Portland, Oregon, came out with an actual handbook on residential meadows, on designing and installing and managing your own residential meadow. Uh, agencies like the, the uh, NRCS and the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Service have come out with landowner guides for folks who still manage little uh, parcels of these native prairies or native meadows. So there's a growing recognition for this and people are responding by integrating these native meadow plants back into home gardens. This blue flower here is the, the camas. You've got the, the Douglas meadow foam, that beautiful uh, poached egg looking flower there. The pink flower is sea blush or plectritus. We've got people integrating these meadow plants into parking strips and sidewalks in places like Seattle and Tacoma and Portland uh, with the, the checker mallow, this purple flower here. And the yellow one is Oregon sunshine, Areophyllum. Uh, so people are discovering that these, these plants actually have landscape features that they've got functional value that you can even walk on some of these and they can withstand a certain amount of human uh, foot traffic and pet traffic. So we have, we have people using things like prunella in bee lawns or the nemophila, that, that blue flower in uh, bee lawns. And we're fortunate that we have, unlike say the tall grass prairie system, we've got typically kind of short statured plants here that can be integrated into these, these uh, more traditionally modern human land landscapes quite easily. Uh, here in my, my hometown, Port Townsend, Washington, we've, have, we've got one of the more uh, exuberant and dazzling examples of a historically intact native meadow with the camas and this uh, spring gold, a lomatium, a member of the carrot family here in bloom last May. And this is, uh, you know, a five minute walk from, from where I am right now in the middle of our town and was a neglected corner of a golf course that local native plant folks were just walking around in one day and they discovered 
some of these plants and they they realized if we stopped mowing this little quadrant of the golf course there's something quite remarkable here underneath it uh, we even have agencies like Portland International Airport uh, planting really, really large scale native wildflower meadows in the flight path of one of their runways uh, with vegetation tall enough to dissuade geese from hanging out in there, but um, also not restoring it to a tree canopy, which would attract songbirds and perching birds that might also prevent uh, a wildlife hazard. So I'll share with you one of a, a series of uh, projects, really large scale projects that are taking flight here in the Northwest now. And to begin with the project I'm, I'll share with you, just to give you some context, uh, in downtown Seattle, there was something called the Alaska Way Viaduct, which was, <laughs> a architecturally interesting feature to accommodate a two-way highway um, basically in the middle of downtown squished between the middle of the central downtown business district and Elliott Bay on Puget Sound and so to build a two-way highway they had to build essentially a double-decker highway they built this in 1953 a, the design of it was critiqued um, probably from the moment it was built and probably the year after it was built, people started to discuss how it might be removed and replaced with something else. Uh, if any of you are familiar with the concept of brutalist architecture, that's probably a good description for the old Alaska Way viaduct. So after many decades of people dissatisfied by the feature of a double-decker concrete bridge blocking the view of the ocean from downtown, uh, plans were implemented to reroute the highway underneath the city, not to mention the fact that there were a number of earthquake uh, concerns around the stability of this structure. So in doing this, um, there was a point at which the Alaska Way viaduct could not go through the city anymore. So it was routed underground through what was called the Battery Street Tunnel. Um, so the Battery Street Tunnel had an opening, had openings on both ends like tunnels do. And when those, uh, when the viaduct was decommissioned and a completely new underground roadway system was built, these tunnels were filled in and the entrance points, the entrance and exit points were, were essentially filled over. Now the city had, um, sort of an unclear vision for what it wanted to do with these sites, but they knew that they wanted to have some landscape feature that would function in the public interest. And green space is a premium in central Seattle. So the, this is the, the land use that has currently won favor and, and is being put into motion. Um, there is the potential that these may be developed at some point down the road. But one of these tunnel sites was basically half a city block, uh, this triangular section here. You can see at the end of the arrow tip, this is next to the Space Needle and adjacent to the Bill and Melinda Go Gates Foundation. And the, the local stakeholders decided this should become a wildflower meadow right here in the middle of this otherwise concrete infrastructure. Uh, they reached out to us at Northwest Meadowscapes to help with this, uh, to give them some basic input on the, the design and installation process. Um, unfortunately, it became a, a hugely complicated effort in part because since this had been a former roadway, the soil underneath it was heavily contaminated with benzene and, and other uh, remnants of, of years of auto traffic. Uh, 
And so they had to essentially pull back some of the, the fill soil that had gone in. They had to lay down this uh, ugly orange barrier fencing to alert people, apparently a hundred years from now, that if they're digging down into this, that there is a contaminated soil layer beneath and that they should cease their activities. So um, this was sort of the first step in creating this meadow is they had, to, they had to delineate where there was a contaminated soil layer and where they would be working from. So during this site work, we also had the rainy season where, you know, sometimes some years you'll get 36 inches of rain in this part of Seattle. So erosion management became a big issue and there was massive amounts of uh, erosion protection textiles installed over the site. And eventually, um, once the contaminated layer was delineated and marked off and, and, uh, pay and uh, fill had been put back over it, the site was capped with native soil that was removed from a road construction project several counties away. So there was a tremendous amount of site work that went into this effort. And because of the size and the budget, transplanting this with native meadow plants was just not an option. So it ended up being seeded um, and being hydro seeded, which we could spend probably a whole day talking about hydro seeding native plants. Uh, but carefully seeded and then hydro mulch applied over it. There were 30 plus species of native meadow plants, including camas installed on the site. And six months after seeding, the site was incredibly lush and prolific with the early establishing uh, annual wildflowers. And we have, unlike the Midwest, we've got a very, um, I think very well represented annual wildflower community in this part of the world, probably roughly equal numbers of annual and perennial wildflowers. Oops. Um, so eight months after seeding. So here we are at the six month point, eight months after seeding, you get a different uh, succession of wildflowers. Uh, this pink one is farewell to spring or Clarkia amoyna. Uh, one of uh, the common native wildflowers of our region. Throughout this, the uh, stakeholders, the, the Gates Foundation, the city, the, the landscape architecture firm were really interested in knowing what was going on with the recolonization of the site by pollinators. So um, they looked at uh, what was showing up visiting the, the wildflowers. We saw some really interesting surprises, uh, things like Bombus griziacolis, which you don't normally see in downtown Seattle, were quickly showing up on the site. Uh, there were surfed flies, paper wasps, potter wasps, uh, soldier beetles, lace wings, just kind of a, a ridiculously interesting group of animals that had quickly appeared in a site where the nearest adjacent green space is probably a mile away. And the nearest adjacent native plant dominated green space is probably much further away than that. Um, but even as surprising as that was, some of the more um, fascinating things were that we had things like um, grasshoppers showing up and looking at a map, I could not conceive of where a grasshopper would have come from to occupy this half acre block in the middle of downtown Seattle. But we also had the, the golden digger wasps uh, showing up, which, uh, you know, are potentially preying upon those grasshoppers. There was a white crowned uh, song sparrow. This is a bad photo. This is as close as the, the bird would let me get, but there was a pair of those nesting in this meadow as well. Uh, and to see all of this transpire in 
essentially one growing season was, was fascinating. So there's the other end of this tunnel, which is now undergoing um, sort of a similar process. Because the erosion on this was a, a much more acute concern, the Department of Transportation immediately reseeded this upon capping it uh, just to get vegetation on site, they ended up with a less than ideal mix of plants, including uh, a creeping bent grass and the sweet alyssum that you see here flowering. But the neighborhood association has now gotten together and they're working towards um, this implementing this management plan to now convert this to a, a plant community that's dominated by native grasses and native wildflowers. I'll just point out that in doing this kind of work, and I know some of you are also working in urban landscapes, you guys probably know that soils are everything in these urban areas, that they're oftentimes dramatically altered from their original form. They're oftentimes prone to heavy compaction and weird drainage and uh, altered uh, microbiology. They oftentimes have uh, strongly alkaline conditions from concrete leaching into them. In my part of the world, these soils can be also pretty gnarly from human waste, uh, people using them as toilets, people throwing syringes in them. Uh, so there's a lot of, of interesting soil considerations that we have to take into account in working in these uh, human landscapes. And in, in this part of the world, you know, you can't typically just solve these problems by adding compost. It's hard to get compost, particularly here, that isn't um, really where you, you don't have strong assurance that it's free of, of weed seed. So I'm going to, uh, let me do a quick time check here, just go through kind of a basic recipe and then we'll get into the, the alchemy as the last stuff, the really, the fascinating things that I am inspired by every day and that really capture my attention and imagination. Eric, doing you, this work. you have about five minutes to two. Okay. I'm going to take six minutes, Lori. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, these kinds of plantings, at least in our region, are super cost effective. Uh, seed, native seed here is much more expensive than in the Midwest, but even here, you know, we can do nice plantings for um, 10 cents a square feet. The recipe for a long time in the Pacific Northwest was to cu cultivate an area of ground to solarize that with clear plastic and bury the edges of it to create this airtight seal. You usually do that in May or June. Let the sun bear down on that and heat the soil to kill any rhizomes or, or weed seeds. You pull that, uh, that solarization plastic off in the fall, you seed that bare ground, and this is the kind of result you get, you know, less than a year later you can have wildflowers this way and again you get this succession of wildflowers this way this is how we've we've done it for a long time here in the northwest is it the best way um i'm not so sure so since formulating that recipe uh, and really doing that with um some tremendous opportunities through zero seas over the years we're, we're starting to rethink some of that. And one of the things that we're rethinking is the use of clear plastic for solarization. And in fact, I am certainly seeing better results from black plastic, from high, uh, uh, high quality silage tarps that are fairly heavy and rip resistant and laying those down with sandbags for a full year is typically giving me better results than clear plastic is in part because it it is cloudy here in this part of the world um oops one of the other approaches that i'm certainly paying more attention to is the use of green hay as opposed to just straight seed mixes for uh, for planting new meadow areas. So green hay, this is a concept that comes from Europe, and it's actually a concept that was used in the upper Midwest 
a long time ago in prairie restoration, where you're cutting essentially the biomass out of an existing meadow, mowing it out, uh, bagging it up using something like a forage harvester and capturing the stems and the seeds and the insect eggs and the insect larvae and spreading all of that out into a new, newly prepared area, sometimes called donor meadow transplanting. Um, so it, it's different than applying a seed mix in that you're applying a whole ecosystem with this approach. Uh, you can, you can, and we are using these approaches of the silage tarps and the green hay transplanting together. You can see on the screen here, this shows you sort of the process. So on the far left, you have the established perennials. That area was under black plastic two years ago. Then the plastic was removed over to the right where it says first year annuals and the, estab the area that says established perennials was seeded. And then in the uh, year after that, the plastic was moved one more step over to the right where you see it now. And again, the area that says first year annuals, the hay was brought over from the far left. So if you're following this, we're essentially moving the plastic further to the right every year and mowing the hay on the left and raking it over to the right, to the bare ground. So these areas are being seeded with the hay, the seeds, the stems, everything from the areas on the left year after year. Uh, it's also more cost effective than the use of seed alone. Uh, working with bulbs is one more of sort of the magical components of uh, working on meadows in this part of the world. We have so many plants here that are geophytes that produce bulbs. And they're amazing to work with because they have higher, much higher survival rates in the field than plugs. They're more successful than seeds because they're already growing. They're just this perfect storage organism. You can plant them into existing degraded areas with weeds and these things have this, the carbohydrate storage to succeed. These can be mechanically planted. You can also uh, grow the seeds in flats and get them to produce little bulblets or bulbils. Um, and is, when those go dormant in the fall, you can put those into a drill seeder and you're essentially planting miniature bulbs through a drill seeder much like planting seed, but again, it's already a living plant. And we have all these different plant species here that are well adapted to this. Got uh, like two more slides here, Lori, and then just some final thoughts. Um, the last, one of the last uh, kind of plant specific things I'll point out is this plant yellow rattle, Rhinanthus minor. This is a plant that is much more common the higher uh, north you go in the world, but its distribution does dip down here a little bit into the Pacific Northwest. This plant is a cornerstone of meadow restoration in Europe now, where people refer to it as, a met, as the meadow maker. This is a parasite of grasses. And in parasitizing grasses with hostoria, these root-like structures that suck the nutrients out of plants, they reduce the vigor and abundance of grasses in meadow and increase the wildflower abundance overall. It's a remarkable plant. We were lucky to uh, be able to start propagating this here on our farm a couple of years ago, and I am completely sold on, on it doing what it is claimed to do. Uh, last kind of functional thought here is, yeah, I think there's a strong case to be made, and I would say this for any meadow, any prairie that folks are managing. I don't think we, we give enough consideration to the potential value of overseeding uh, our prairies and meadows, especially if it's been an abandoned or neglected old field prior to that where it may have hundreds of pounds of, of dormant weed seeds still buried down there in the soil. We can make up for some of that uh, continuous weed seed rain that occurred for decades by going back in 
and doing supplemental overseeding year after year. Uh, um, and in my part of the world, grasses begin to take over meadows if there's not some routine overseeding. But kind of the winning combination is both haying, removing the biomass every fall, and then overseeding with additional wildflowers. The de deprivation of the nutrients from the grasses by removing the biomass and providing some supplemental overseeding continues to provide some of the highest quality meadows. And there's lots of things, the hard seeded things, the yellow rattle, the self peel, the lupins, the canvas that all can work their way down through a thatch layer and establish into a grassy meadow. Um, this is one of the ways that we're working to take borderline areas, degraded pastures that might only have a 10% uh, native plant composition and to tip the scales back towards something a little more native. Uh, Lori, if I can go one more moment here, I'm wrapping up. Um, I just wanted to leave you guys with one kind of overarching thought. I have a book, new book coming out apparently this year called The Milkweed Lands. Um, but there's this passage in it called The Joy of Meadows that I wanted to leave you with. It's the end of the day. So I'll put on my spectacles because I'm a half century old and I've lost half my eyesight. So the joy of meadows. There's a remarkable irony to the fact that nature's response to most land disasters is to grow a meadow. Described as early successional habitat by ecologists, meadows are usually the first plant community to sprout up after a forest fire or bomb blast. Meadows are the plant communities that reclaim fallen factories, abandoned shopping malls, and raised city blocks with contaminated soils. We often overlook meadows when we first think about the nature, when we first think about nature and conservation. Meadow, forests, sorry, forests with their darkness and drama loom in the imagination and mobilize worthy sympathies for their protection. The scale of mountains and oceans requires us to recognize them as wilderness beyond our full grasp. But meadows are an afterthought. This is okay because meadows don't mind if we overlook them. Despite the lack of attention, they are brilliantly full of living things from microbes to mammals to plants that spread their seeds in amazing ways. They support this life while also function, functioning as humanity's janitorial service, capturing our waste, whether factory effluent, cigarette butts, or old sofas, turning it all into something green. Meadows sequester enormous amounts of carbon. They give us somewhere to walk. They allow us to spot enemies from far away. They give us ample spaces to try out dubious ideas. Meadows and humans thrive together. At first, this seems doubtful. After all, we lament how meadows have changed through the ages due to our abuse. It's true that they constantly suffer from invasive species, altered drainage, pollution, and dumping, urban development, fragmentation, periodic fires, grazing, and other agricultural attempts. They also suffer from the boorish human instinct that any grassy piece of land should be fair game for selfish wants. We have built great Midwestern cities on meadows. We've built racetracks over them and Ikea stores and nuclear waste dumps. Even so, meadows always come back. Every crack in the pavement sprouts a new one. At first, it might only be a single blade of grass. Then joined by other blades and other cracks, eventually the cracks coalesce and the whole riotous affair starts to swallow up our rubbish, paying us back with grasshoppers and flowers. Frankly, it's magic. As long as we don't turn our world into a desert, we can and will unwittingly recreate this magic every time. To be accurate, the meadows of today certainly look unlike those of 100 or 1,000 years ago. Yet on the whole, the meadow ecosystem has remained our constant partner. It's where our own species originated, at least according to the ecological theory known as the savanna hypothesis. Our innate preference for open meadow landscapes with a few scattered trees is confirmed by numerous studies of human psychology. This measurable bias is strongest in children. Meadows are our ecosystem. Within them, we invented agriculture and learned to master fire. We built the starter homes of civilization from prairie sod and the skins of wild grassland beasts. We fashioned fibers out of long pliable grasses and other meadow plants. Almost the entirety of human existence has had us living in or around meadows. 
I take comfort in this, that a living system can bear what meadows do is nothing short of amazing. Responding to abuse or disaster, Earth's meadows just morph into new versions of themselves, sometimes in new places. This is the most remarkable natural history story that I know. Meadows don't easily go away. They adjust things around a little, adapt, and accidentally look beautiful in the process, like the raucous wildflowers within them, and like all of us.